is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Obelisk Gate, book two in the Broken Earth series, chapters seven and eight. Nasun finds the moon, and you've been warned. So, guys, I almost hit the ceiling when I found out who was at the moon. That sentence sounds insane, but I, I'm not excited about this turn of events. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Denise is here in the chat. Hi, Denise. Um, Denise is the one who commissioned this. So thank you very much to Denise for that. And thank you for being flexible because I had a little thing happen this morning and lost a bunch of my reading time. And uh, I had to push this episode back. It was meant to happen this morning. So um, thank you, Denise, for being understanding about that. It's a, not a great morning. Hopefully the rest of the day picks up. Um, but yeah, this section, man. I, w I did go back and review some of the previous section um, just to refresh myself on exactly what was going on. Felt myself getting heartbroken all over again at what goes on between Nasun and her father. And I felt like I even started to understand a little bit better what was going on between um, Nasun and uh, Alabaster because there was like a lot of, a lot of what's, and, and this is something that I, I, particularly like usually. Um, but a lot of this book is implied and n doesn't come from where uh, people are. It doesn't come from people directly saying stuff. Does that make sense? So there are a lot of things that are, it's a little bit confusing enough to me that if they don't just say it straight out, I don't get it. And I will get it in retrospect, but at the time, I'm not taking the meaning from those words that I kind of should be. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that I went back and I feel like I'm understanding the conversation about the importance of the moon and the way that this might work with the origins and the magic that's like in their blood a little bit better. Not that I understand like the mechanics of it, but that I kind of get what I think Alabaster is getting at with this. Um, and there's also like, so he is, there, there's also this moment between, um, her and his guardian as well, because the guardian is fucking eating him. It's just after everything that went on with the boil bugs and whatnot, um, it just really unhinges me to know that apparently every time he does something he is going to have this react like he's he's decaying or something it's uh, it is really freaking me out um it's not until you're halfway down the infirmary's long central aisle that you consciously notice the sound you've been hearing all along a kind of hum it seems monotonous at first but as you concentrate on it you detect multiple tones harmonies a subtle rhythm music Music so alien, so difficult to parse that you're not sure what word really applies. You can't figure out where it's coming from. At first, Alabaster is still where you saw him that morning on a pile of cushions and blankets on the, fo on the floor. No telling why Lerna hasn't put him on a cot. Um, the music is coming from the stone eater, you realize in wonder. Antimony sits cross-legged near Alabaster's nest, utterly still, looking as though someone bothered to sculpt a woman sitting cross-legged with one hand upraised. Um, you realize he's leaning back against Antimony's hand. There are no patches of stone on his chest or belly, and only a few small burns around his shoulders, most of those healed. But his torso is nearly skeletal. Um, so yeah, this description of his body, like when she has that talk with Lerna about whether she could have fixed the problem with the boil bugs right away, he says something about how obvious it is that Alabaster's the one who did this because he sustained burns consistent with like 
high heat and poison gas. So people are going to start catching on, which that didn't even occur to me. Him, He himself sustaining damage because of what he did. But damn. Um, so the, the, uh, you took him from us and we couldn't do it alone. Uh, I couldn't do it alone. If Alabaster had been he- there, I hated you. Afterward, while I was wandering, I vowed to find a way to kill you. Put you in an obelisk like that other one. Bury you in the ocean, far enough out that no one will ever dig you up. You can't even read the catch of her breath because she doesn't breathe. This really is pointless. Um, So yeah, this moment is just... Like... It's one of those things that you're like glad that she's getting out what she feels, but at the same time, it's so unsatisfying because it provokes no reaction, really, except for the woman, like, stopping the singing. Um, But yeah, I just, this is what I feel like the sort of theme of this book is, is dissatisfaction with the result of finally coming to terms with things. Like, I feel like that's just so much of what happens here. And that's not a criticism at all. Don't take it that way. This is just me being really touched at the trueness of that, you know? Um, so anyway, then she has the conversation with Alabaster about how she was able to maintain uh, or how she was able to improve and it being from raising children, all of this stuff. This is, you know, but I just wanted to touch on that because it struck me this time around. Um, and then when we get to Nasun finds the moon, y'all. <sighs> all right. So when we start off, I don't think I really thought through how much time has actually passed since Nasun's story comes to us. Because going to what happened in Tirimu or Tirumu, I don't remember. But they, like, we have gone back in time, what, at that point? Like, six months I feel like as soon there was a part that I read where she had clearly been on the road for way longer than I realized that it just took so much longer to move on out of here than I even knew um and to get to you know so like it turns out at one point that she's been traveling like a year and I don't know if we are at a year with Asun, or if Nasun has jumped ahead of Asun in the story timeline at this point. Um, but yeah, we get a little reference to the fact that um, Ika is sending out that summons to all origins still. But by the time that Ika starts to transmit them, um, Nasun has moved far enough out from it that she doesn't actually feel the pull. She gets a little bit of it in her dreams, but she doesn't wake up and like feel compelled to go in that direction. Um, when they do have to stop at comms, some are only in lockdown and haven't yet declared seasonal law, hoping the worst of it won't come so far south, probably. It's rare for seasons to affect the whole continent at once. Nasun never speaks of what she is to strangers, but if she could... She would tell them that there is nowhere to hide from this season. Some parts of the stillness will suffer the full effect later than others, but eventually it will be bad everywhere. Some of the comms they stop at invite them to stay. Jeej is older, but hale and strong, and his napping skills and resistance use cast make him valuable. Nasun's young enough to be trained in nearly any needed skill, and she is visibly healthy and tall for her age, already showing signs of growing into her mother's strong mid ladder frame. There are few places they stop, strong comms with deep stores and friendly people, where she wishes she could stay. Jija always refuses, though. He's got some destination in mind. So this is crazy to me, because Jija is clearly at this point already thinking about the moon. And I want to know how in the fuck the moon is a totally unfamiliar word to people like as soon or uh what's her name the one that she's like traveled with with the uh dreadlocked hair 
But they don't like this doesn't ring any bells. And yet Jija knows about it. How is that possible? Like, I'm I'm so curious about that. And I hope that that gets explained because I just don't, you know, the people who are sort of like, have been the closest or have been themselves in origin, you would think, would hear rumors of this sort of thing themselves. So the fact that he's the one that is aware of it, and they don't recognize the name or the word moon at all, is just weird. So I guess we'll find that out, hopefully. Um, and they have a couple of encounters where they almost like get locked in and uh or and or shot um one of them they steal the cart which is allowed nasun and jija to get so much farther away so much faster not only because of the cart itself but because they're able to barter with people using transportation on the cart as leverage that they don't have to like stop and forage for supplies and stuff they're able to get a lot of what they need just by people coming up to them and needing a ride somewhere. So that saves them a lot of time as well. Um, and at another com, whose people don't even bother to warn them before aiming crossbows, it is Nasun who saves them. She does this by wrapping her arms around her father and setting her teeth in the earth and dragging every iota of life and heat and movement out of the whole calm until it is a gleaming frosted confection of ice slivered slate walls and still solid bodies. She will never do this again. The way Gigi looks at her afterward. Yo, like that's so badass, And also again, broken hearted, just like, ouch guys, this is hard. Um, and I'm just going to finish this next bit and then like tell you what I was thinking when I read this. They, st they stay in the dead calm for a few days, resting in empty houses and replenishing their supplies. No one bothers this calm while they are there because Nasun keeps the walls iced as a clear danger here, worn off. They cannot stay long, of course. Eventually other comms in the area will band together and come to kill the Raga whom they will assume threatens them all. A few days of warm water and fresh food. Jija cooks one of the comms frozen chickens for a real treat, and they move on. Before the bodies thaw and start stinking, see. So, this is such matter-of-fact language for something that is so nuts, if you really think about it. And this is my specialty, is I extrapolate and theorize about what ifs as I'm reading a thing or watching something. This is why my questions about Doctor Who aren't about the monsters or different places you could go or timelines or planets. My questions are, where do they sleep on the TARDIS, though? Is there a shower? Like, baths? Do we get, like, you know, where's our food supply coming from? Do you stop and that's like you just travel in this and then you sleep somewhere else? Like, I don't know. But that's the stuff that comes to my mind when I'm asking questions about stuff. And this, when I thought about what it would look like cinematically for her to freeze this whole calm like she does and then go in and try and live there for a day or two. It is simultaneously so horrifying and also kind of hilarious because like, think about it. There's, they're trying, they're pulling their crossbows back. One of them may even have like launched one off. She freezes everything up and that arrow probably is like mid flight and gets coated in ice and then just falls straight down. Very anticlimactic. And then they go inside and they have to like push through a frozen gate. They have to step around people and go into someone's home and pick them up off of their kitchen chair and put them somewhere or just like everything they have to do. They've got to grab a thing and unstick it because it's frozen. They like there's chickens just paused and they've got to have to figure out like how to get the feathers off this thing before they cook it. Cause they're all frozen in place. Like there's all this stuff that I think about that. I'm like, 
this shouldn't be hilarious, but it's a little hilarious. Like, how weird. And having to step around frozen people and bodies all over the place. Like, surreal. They're just staring at you like you're in a department store front window, you know? Just, uh, my, my my mind works in, in ways that are very distracting at times. It can be fun, but I can also be just as irritated with it as people who listen to my show and get mad at tangents. My brain tangents like nuts. Um, and so it goes. Bandits and scammers and a near-fatal gas waft and a tree that fires wooden spikes when warm bodies are in proximity. Hi. What? We're just going to drop that in there? Excuse me? That's just said as, a, you know, oh, bandits and what? And then a spike, a tree that shoots spikes out. No. No. No, you don't put that in the same sentence with semicolons and shit to act like that's just a normal part of the sentence that you just said. Ex just back up and explain this, please, to me. I need to know all about it. But no, we don't get to find out about it. Um, Nasun has a growth spurt, even though she is always hungry and rarely full. By the time they finally approach the place that Jija has heard about, she is three inches taller and a year has passed. So she is sort of suspecting as they head north that they're going to this place that has a sort of like a uh, satellite fulcrum location. Basically, she thinks that he's going to hand her over to the fulcrum, which that seems reasonable to think that that might be the case if you know that there's something up there. Um, and it's not until she's listening to her dad and this woman talking that she hears him ask this woman, have you ever heard of the moon? And because of apparently people knowing what the moon is again, why does that woman know what the moon is? But this word doesn't mean anything. I will not let that go guys. If that's not explained at some point, why these people that should know about something where you, you can be supposedly cured, don't know about it. I'm going to be a little bit irritated. I'm not going to lie to you. But he asks this woman and she kind of like gasps a little bit because that clearly tells her that this guy's kid is an origin. So what he does is basically offer to fuck her real quick because he's just trying to distract her from getting, you know, doing something, who knows what, to Nasoon. And or getting some other people to help her do something to Nasun because they get up and leave really, really early in the morning before this woman can wake up and, you know, run around and get help from the neighbors and stuff. Um, but yeah, this like this whole thing is so I really enjoy the fact that this writer writes a man transacting using sex because I feel like that is so often this thing that like writers fall back on for women's situations. And I mean, there's good reason for doing that. Don't get me wrong. Women are propositioned and hit on and, and just harassed so often that being like, Oh, she was probably propositioned by some creepy dude is not usually a bad estimate of what went on. Like, honestly, but I rarely see that for dudes. And I feel like it's got to be just as true for certain guys, you know, like, so I appreciated that he has to have this transactional sex. Um, because I just don't really see that having to come from male characters almost ever. And women want sex too. And women are attracted to men to a point where they would be willing to pay for sex from that guy at times as well. This is not simply a male phenomenon, even though we are weirdly cultured to think it is. So, you know, this woman being like, yeah, all right, if you fuck me, I'll just pretend right now that I don't know about your kid. I mean, if the guy is hot enough, that makes total sense to me, you know? So anyway, they get up and leave before they can, you know, be a, be treated as a threat. And they're going up into the Arctic or Antarctic, I guess. And it turns out that they're far enough away from what's going on with this uh, season that it is 
really green and there's tons of animals and it feels like things haven't changed up here yet. And eventually it will. But for right now, this is as close to how things were before as you're going to get. And there's something almost surreal about that. Um, here and there on the topography of her awareness, Nasun can detect gas vents and a few boils that have come to the surface as hot springs and geysers. All this moisture and the warm ground are what keep the trees green. Then the trees part, and before them looms something Nasun has never seen before. A rock formation, she thinks, but one that seems to consist of dozens of long columnar ribbons of brown-gray stone that ripple in an upslope, gradually slanting high enough to qualify as a low mountain or a tall hill. At the top of this river of stone, she can see bushy green tree canopies, the formation plateaus up there. Atop that plateau, Nasun can glimpse something through the trees, which might be a rounded rooftop or storecase tower, a settlement of some kind. But unless they climb along the columnar ribbons, which looks dangerous, she's not sure how to get up there. Um, ooh, Denise is in the... I figured as a Raga hater, Jija is more likely to have the conversations which lead to the moon, whereas Asun would probably avoid any conversations, re origin conversion. Similarly, her friend would be less likely to pay attention to rumors than read facts. I mean, it's one thing to not pay attention to rumors. It's another thing for a word to make no impression at all. You know, if she was like, oh, yeah, I think I've heard something about that, but no, I don't really know anything about it. I would even buy that. But the word, she says it like she's never heard the word before. And as soon, I would think, would be, I understand the idea that like, well, if you are a hater, that you would want to know about this sort of thing more than if you actually are an origin. But I feel like if you're an origin, you're going to be hyper aware of people talking about Raga's, especially because Braga is a slur, like any time that comes up that you're going to sort of zero in on that conversation. And if they don't know that Asun is an origin, I just can't imagine them not like talking about these rumors around her. I don't know. And like the way that she has just been on the move for, you know, who knows how long by the time they have this conversation and it still has never come up or nobody like talks about it to her, you know, I I just really have a hard time believing this is common enough knowledge that he can share it with this random woman and she knows what it is, but it has never, ever come up for a soon, especially after a season has started, because everybody's going to be talking about, well, we, um, we're having like another fucking cataclysm and we should be sending them all to the fucking moon, which is hilarious, but also, you know, something that you would think people would be talking about even more than usual because we're all suffering now because of somebody with these abilities. I don't know. It just doesn't ring true to me, but whatever. It's fine. Um, okay. So she knows as she's looking at this, that the only people who can climb up this are probably origins that he isn't going to be able to get up there and she can. And also that it was origins that built this place. And there's something about this moment of her watching every, every infinitesimal movement that he makes that is so fucking familiar to me. Like, there is something about my childhood that carries all the markers of having been with somebody who was like, physically abusive, and yet I wasn't. And I really I've been trying to like nail down where that comes from. But I had this sort of thing where I would watch for every reaction, because I was afraid to set people off. And I don't know where that fear came from. But I knew that it was a possibility. And this the way this is like, she has guessed that he will tense and he does. She has guessed that he will need to take a deep breath to calm himself, which he also does. He reacts to even the thought of origins, the way that Mama used to react to red wine, with fast breathing and shaking hands and sometimes freezing or weak knees. 
Daddy could never even bring things that were burgundy colored into the house, but sometimes he would forget and do it anyway, and once it was done, there was no reasoning with Mama. Nothing to be done but wait for her shakes and rapid breathing and hand wringing to pass. Hand rubbing. Nasoon did not notice the distinction, but Nasoon was rubbing one hand, the old ache there in the bones. Yeah, so just the color of burgundy basically gives her a PTSD induced panic attack, which that feels true. That feels like it makes sense. These are people who not only ruled over her during one of the like darker periods in her life and treated her like she was some sort of animal, but then track her the fuck down when she's finally happy and kill her child or force her to kill her child. Same thing. Yeah, that tracks. Um, so he says, her father says, there should be others like you there. And he, and he says, it's better than the fulcrum. They can cure you. That's what the stories say. And she's about to be like, cure me of what? And then she realizes and is like, oh my God, I'm such a dummy. And she asks how, because she knows that acting displeased with this idea is going to push her dad over the edge. She's so stunned that she forgets to watch her father for a moment. When she remembers, she shivers because he has been watching her. He nods in satisfaction at the look on her face, though. Her surprise is what he wanted to see. That, or maybe wonder or pleasure. He would have reacted poorly to dislike or fear. Yeah, indeed. You've got to act like you're totally cool with this. You even want this. Sure, take all of my power from me. It's nothing to me at all. Um, and she asks how, and he confesses that he doesn't know. Um, and when she says, I really thought the fulcrum would be the place, his he says, trained leash animals, leashed animals are still animals. I want my little girl back. I haven't gone anywhere, Nassun thinks, but knows better than to say. So yeah, this is him, you know, it, it, even if she can control what she is, she is still something else. The fulcrum would not remove her power. It would make her better able to control her power. And that's not what he wants. He wants the power gone. That feels true also, just in general. <laughs> Um, so she sort of has this moment of just like, I'm going to have to bide my time and like figure out exactly how I even feel about this. And he like looks at her and asks, can you do it? Because they hear, uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. Oh yeah, here it is. Doubtless, the members of the Kam know some secret way to get up the plateau, but without this knowledge, Nasun and Jija are left with a puzzle to solve. Can you do it? She stands up. He stumbles back as if startled, then stops and glowers at her. She just stands there, letting him see how much it hurts her, that he fears her so. A muscle flexes in his jaw. Some of his anger fades into chagrin. Only some. Will you ha have to kill this forest to do it? Oh, she can understand some of his worry now. This is the first green place they've seen in a year. No, Daddy, she says. There's a volcano. Um, So he is about to be like, all right. And all of a sudden they hear, uh, I think they hear horses. Something chuffs into the ground nearby. Doo -doo -doo. I'm not sure if they're on horseback. I sort of pictured them that way. But I guess they're like in pretty deep woods. So they're probably not. They're probably on foot. But um, this fucking like harpoon basically goes through his calf. It's huge, two inches in circumference. And it like goes into the ground behind him so hard that it basically pins him in place. Um, and she can hear people talking amongst themselves with some language that she has never heard before. And as she is standing there and she's like, deciding because she wants so badly to not 
kill these people in front of her dad and make him give like he just has so much reason to fear her and even though I'm sure if you talk to her, she would realize that it doesn't really make any difference at this point. It still does make a difference, though. Like, you know, so she's very, very reticent to do this. And she is, as it says, torn between survival and daughterhood. Then someone leaps down the lava flow ridge, bouncing from one ribbon of rock to the other with a speed and agility that is... Nasun stares. No one can do that. But the man lands in a crouch amid the gravelly soil at the foot of the ridges with a heavy, ominous thud. He's solidly built. She can tell he's big, even though he stays low as he half rises and draws a long, wicked glass knife. And yet somehow the weight of his landing on the ground does not reverberate on her senses. What does that mean? And there is... She shakes her head, thinking maybe it's an insect, but the odd buzzing is a sensation, not a sound. Then the man is off, running straight into the brush, his feet pushing against the ground with such force that clods of dirt kick up in his wake. So this guy basically does like a fucking... (laughs) He's basically like Quicksilver right here and just goes up to all of these bandits and kills them in seconds like it's just he's stabbing people and then on to the next person before the first person even hits the ground it's you know and i'm thinking to myself this sounds like something like i hadn't even quite formulated the thought is this a guardian in my head by this point it hadn't even come to that it was just my vague like memories of what they're like subconsciously coming to the surface and i'm just like oh no um so as this guy is attacking these bandits and she realizes that he is sort of on her side she bends down and she does this thing with the harpoon in her dad's leg because she's thinking that maybe she can yank it out And the chain that's attached to it, like, there's no moving that without really fucking up his leg even more. It's just a, it's super bad. Um, And she thinks to herself, metal breaks if it's cold enough, doesn't it? Could she maybe with a high, narrow torus? She's never done this before. If she does it wrong, she'll freeze off his leg. Yet somehow instinctively, she feels certain that it can be done the way mama taught her to think about origin or or origin as heat and movement taken in and heat and movement pushed out has never really felt right to her there is truth to it it works she knows from experience but thinking but something about it is off inelegant she has often thought if i don't think about it as heat without ever finishing that thought in a productive way mama is not here and death is, and her father is the only person left in the world who loves her, even though his love comes wrapped in pain. Is that a fucking sentence or what? Ugh, you guys, just kill me. She just keeps on, like, tricking me into forgetting because of the action that everything is terrible, and then being like, poke, still terrible. Um... So Jija is starting to get to the point where he's like going to pass out. And Nasun is low key glad because she needs to concentrate. She puts her free hand on his leg. Since her origin has always flinched away from freezing her, even back when she couldn't fully control it, and closes her eyes. There is something underneath the heat of the volcano, interspersed amid the wavelets of motion that dance through the earth. It's easy to manipulate the waves and heat, but hard to even perceive this other thing, which is perhaps why Mama taught Nasun to look for waves and heat instead. But if Nasun can grasp the other thing, which is finer and more delicate and also more precise than the heat and waves, if she can shape it into a kind of sharp edge and file it down to infinite fineness and slice it across the shaft like so... There is a quick, high-pitched hiss as the air between her and Jija stirs. Then the chain tip of the harpoon shaft drops loose, the shorn faces of metal glimmering mirror-smooth in the afternoon light. 
Um, so she opens her eyes, feeling very satisfied that she was able to pull this off. But her dad is looking behind her and looking really flipped out. So she doesn't even really get a chance to savor what she just did. And here's my interpretation of what she just did. She used fucking magic. This is some bitch that has figured out what her mother still hadn't figured out. And that's why she was able to sense this so young. Because Asun is brought through to seeing it by Alabaster, who knows it's there, and is instructing her to like feel through the empty spaces, which she at first recoils from. Because she's, you know, used to this, like, this exp exploration of stone. But when it's a body, she's like, this is gross. I hate this. But this little girl has figured out whatever this is in the spaces between things. And I feel like it has to be in her that she thinks she's feeling between, like, the, 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 heat waves in the stone or something and that's not even exactly what's happening either she's accessing the magic that's in her body and isn't aware that it's part of her or there is magic in the ground here that she is somehow accessing i don't know like i don't feel like if there's ma if there's magic in the ground here i feel like it would have to be everywhere and that as soon would have like figured this out I don't feel like she has. So I don't know if it's because of this location being special or Nasun being special or what, but there's something up, you know, like I'm just dying to know about that. Um, so this dude is standing there. He's got his black hair. That's really long falls below his waist. Um, and he's super, super tall. And he comments on what she just did and says, that's quite the trick. And she's like flipped out that he saw what she did because, of course, she's trying to hide what she is from everybody. Um, and she, the guy, comes up to her and says, don't be afraid. He blinks then, something flickering and uncertain in his gaze. Um, the man blinks, the uncertainty clears, the smile returns. The beasts are dead. I came to help you, didn't I? Something is off about the question. He asks as if he seeks confirmation, didn't I? It's too sincere, too heartfelt somehow. Then he says, I won't let anyone hurt you. Perhaps it is only coincidence that his gaze slides over to her father's face as he says this. But something in Nasun unclenches just a little. <sighs> is that rough or what? Like, this is what's so fucking insidious about people like this, is that they figure out exactly your soft spot and they know how to make it seem like they're on your side. And they, he of course knows what her soft spot probably is because he has to be able to look at them and know their father and daughter and assume that if she's an origin, he, her own dad is a danger to her. He knows well enough, you know, this is instinctual for him. Even if he has forgotten what he used to do, he, it, this is some built in fucking software that he's working with. And he senses that she is at like in a vulnerable position with somebody whom she simultaneously loves and fears, and he just laser like goes right in for that. So even though the I came to save you, didn't I? That whole like he's doing the usual trying to connect sort of creepy camp counselor thing that he does, and she's not prepared for that. But when he does something subtler like this, that fucking hits home, that works. Ugh, ugh, I hate him. I hate him so much that he can do this. People that are good at manipulation frequently seem like the answer to your prayers when they show up. That's what makes them so good at what they do. And they manage to make you feel guilty once you realize that they're full of shit. 
and second guess whether or not they really are. Like, didn't I do this, this and that for you? Oh, I hate this guy. I hate him so much. Oh, so gross. Um, so he, when he starts to help Jija, he wants to like pull the harpoon out, but Jija is just like not having it. He backs off, even though it almost causes him to faint to move. Um, and he says, are you from, and sort of, you know, jerks his head. Um, and the man says, oh yes, we saw you coming along the road. We saw the bandits and we've been kind of wanting to get rid of them. And this was a perfect opportunity. Um, his white gaze shifts back to Nassoon, flicking at the sheared off harpoon along the way. He has never stopped smiling. But you should not have had trouble with them. Um, we're looking for the moon. Ah, yes, you found it. What is the moon? That is the name of our community, a very special place for very special people. My name is Shafa. The hand is held out only to Nasoon, and Nasoon doesn't know why. Maybe he knows what she is. Maybe because, maybe only because her hand isn't covered with blood. She swallows and takes the hand, which immediately and firmly closes around hers. Guys, did anybody else's heart stop for just a second right there? Like, I got real scared that he was just going to break her fucking hand. She manages, I'm Nasoon. That's my father. She lifts her chin, Nasun resistant to Remo. Nasun knows that her mother was trained by the fulcrum, which means that Mama's use name was never resistant, and Nasun is only ten years old, too young for Tarimo to recognize with a calm name, even if she still lived there. Yet the man inclines his head gravely, as if it is not a lie. Come then, he says, let's see if between the two of us we can't get your father free. Um, he rises, pulling her with him. Before she can open her mouth to say anything, he presses two fingers to the back of her neck. She flinches and rounds on him, instantly defensive, and he raises both hands, wagging the fingers to show that he's still unharm unarmed. She can feel a bit of damp on her neck, probably a smear of blood. Duty first, he says. What? I can lift him while you shift the leg. She will remember, much later, an instant after the touch, when the tips of the man's fingers glimmered like the cut ends of the harpoon, a gossamer thin thread of light under the heat that seemed to flicker from her to him. She will remember, too, that for a moment that thread of light illuminated others, a whole trace work of jagged lines spreading all over him like the spider webbing that follows a sharp impact in brittle glass. The impact site, the center of the spider web, was somewhere near the back of his head. Nasun will remember thinking in that instant, he is not alone in there. In the moment, it is no matter. Their journey has ended. Nasun is, apparently, home. And this ends with, The guardians do not speak of warrant where they are made. No one knows its location. When asked, they only smile. From Lorist's Tale, Untitled 759, recorded in Charta Cortant, Edencom, by itinerant Mel Lorist Stone. All right, guys, let's fucking back this shit up here. First of all, this is fucking Shafa. My name is Shafa. When he said that shit, I mean, I had, I, of course, had an inkling. That's who this was. But when he just says it and he's still like, I don't know why that fucked me up so bad. The fact that he says it because he doesn't re like he's looking at her and it's like he can sense something about her reminding him of cyanide. It's like he he can tell. I don't know how he can tell, but he can tell something, but not enough to really put her in danger at this point. And I really want to know what that's about, because this whole thing has already been super weird with the guardians like touching aura genes at the back of the neck and sort of absorbing a kind of like power through them. Power doesn't even feel like strong enough a word. 
it feels narcotic to me. Like they're getting a hit of a drug, you know, um, that has already been super strange. Like I'm not totally sure what that's about, but when I look at a strangeness meter, that felt like it was really close to the top and bothered me already. But to add that there's like a dampness to her neck that I don't feel like Cyanite ever mentioned when we were in her chapters. I feel like something has happened to the way that he takes this energy to make it more dangerous for the people he's taking from. I don't know if there was blood and I just didn't remember that or it wasn't mentioned by her or if she didn't, but whatever the case, it feels like this did Nasoon harm in a way that it didn't do others harm. And also the filament that is, is going from his fingers to the back of her neck. Cyanide has never mentioned that either, which is part of what makes me worried. And the filament seems to illuminate this like traces of, of brokenness in him, which is that true of all guardians? Are all guardians broken like this? Or did this simply happen to him because of what he went through on the ship? I tend to think the latter, that maybe that's part of what's harming her is that he's broken and he's trying to like drain from her with a system that isn't actually like, you know, um, Denise says in the first book, young Asun, yeah, cyanite, cyanite is Asun, right? I'm just calling her cyanite because that's what she was called at the fulcrum. So I'm pretty sure that was what he was calling her. Um, Shafa was calling her. But like, I just don't know. Ah, I don't know what to make of this. And like a lot of this, um, uh, Shafa does something to young Asun, which he says helps him find her. I don't remember if it was, if there was blood. Yeah, I don't either. And I'm not su like sure if I'm supposed to remember or not, you know, I don't want anybody to like feel like they need to go through it and tell me if it's going to sort of like be important for me to put this together myself. Um, I don't remember her first name. She started with a D. Oh yeah. Dayama or Diana, something like that. Um, Dam, Damayasa. Um, yeah, you're right. So she wasn't cyanate until she was at the fulcrum. I'm thinking about him calling her that once he's like tracked her down later. Um, but yeah, so, and, and, and what, like, because obviously so much of this book is meant to be a sort of an allegory for the way that black people are treated in the world. People of color in general, but I feel like this is pretty specific to black people. And I had been thinking about it the other day um, about who the guardians are and in this equation, because there are all of the other ordinary people and they are already not here for fucking origins, right? Like, they're scared of them. They turn them out of their houses. If it turn, even if it's one of their own children, like these are not people who are friendly, but it's right out on the table. You know what it is. What is the deal with somebody like a guardian who it's so much, like I said, more insidious. And I have to say, and I might get some flack for this, but I have to say, in general, we've got the world, and that includes white people in general. But the guardians to me represent white liberals in my head. Because white people like to think that if they are liberal, they do not pose their own kind of threat against black people. And they genuinely think when they are condescending and talk about how divisive 
black people are being when they do whatever it is they do to protect themselves. They genuinely seem to think that they are helping. And things wouldn't be bad for you if you would just listen to me and follow these rules. I'm here to help you. I just, I care about you when nobody else does. We want you to succeed if you'll just do these things that we tell you that undermine everything about who you are and your independence as a person and your individuality and power. Like, it is the, the I mean, very recently on Martin Luther King Day, there was the circulation of that speech that he gave about how he has found himself to be most disappointed in the white moderate who keeps saying that this is not the time that, you know, we should just postpone our revolution and fight for our rights and dignity to some other date that it'll be a little bit more convenient, but claiming like the world isn't ready for you. I am, I get it. But you really, I, I just don't think everyone is. And maybe just, you know, I, uh, just don't be so aggressive about it. Like, can you just don't yell, you know, don't like maybe damage property or hold me up on my way to work by protesting in the middle of the freeway. Just be like, you know, like don't inconvenience all of us for this. I there because sh the, the whole thing about Shafa with him being like apparently really friendly, but there being this like possessiveness and this creepiness underneath it. And the fact that he's like feeding off them, it's just all feels so symbolically like it lines up to me, you know, like, like, I mean, it's just a well-known fact that, white folks have stolen a ton of intellectual property as well as actual property from black people stolen the ideas for, you know, different movements. Even today we have like white women stealing hashtags for the me too movement when it was a black woman who came up with that. But this one white woman just gets all of the credit for it. And the, it's like, Liberals can be some of the worst about that because it's all wrapped up in, but we're just trying to help. I mean, yeah, okay, you didn't come up with it, but does it matter who came up with it really? Or does it just, just the concept of it really matter? Maybe we should just focus on what's important here and not focus on you feeling like you've been hurt because I stole this from you. And again, just undermining in this way that if you are less secure in believing yourself worthy, you will fall for that. And they have fallen for their own bullshit, you know? So there's something about this whole, like, vibe that just feels so much scarier to me, because when you're out in the comms, and you're on your own, you at least know everybody's going to be hostile to you, and you absolutely have to hide who you are. This is somebody who tricks you into thinking they are safe. You don't have your guard up the same way, even though you should. And not because you don't think you should have your guard up. It's because you're so tired of always having to have your guard up that even though you're hearing that voice in your head going, nah, something isn't right about this. Another part of you that is exhausted just wants so badly to be safe with this person that you do let your guard down despite your better judgment. And lo and behold, they are sucking the luck, the life out of you when you're not even aware it's happening. Like this is some shit y'all like seriously. And I may come to the end of this book and realize that I had this totally wrong that like my, little assertion and hypothesis about the symbolism here is not what the author intended in any way. But as of right now, like, and, and when the thought of he is not alone in there, that's the other thing that I'm just like, what 
this is that doesn't play into my hypothesis at all. That's just sort of like, what does that mean? Another moment of me going, ooh. So I don't have a place to put that, you know, that thought. I just don't really know how this all fits together. And if there is somebody else in there, what does that even mean? Are all of the guardians just like sort of projections, like puppets or robots or something that literally take actual power, like literal, almost like a jolt of electricity to juice up their batteries? Like he moves so quickly and in such a way that he does not even seem human. Like it's not humanly possible to do what he does. So I just have to think there is something that's like built and assembled about him. But that's a lot. Like that's a lot of work. So and by a lot of work, I mean like creating this whole other race of people that are, you know, artificial intelligence. And if you can do something like that, are you actually like, capable technologically of of putting an end to these fucking seasons like i feel like if you're doing this sort of shit you must be advancing on other stuff and maybe if he's broken some of that programming where he was supposed to like bring them back to fulcrums and stuff has broken and that's why he's he's set up his other weird thing with the moon maybe He's turned a corner and decided like he's genuinely going to help Origins, but I don't have a lot of faith in that. I would love that to be true, that he got broken and has like essentially like turned around to help the quote enemy. But I feel like that's really optimistic. It's just that the name of the place is the moon and the moon is supposed to be what they were all theorizing is sort of going to put an end to the seasons. So that makes me feel like he wants to help because the origins are the ones that are going as far as I have sort of like theorized the origins will be doing something to create a moon, which could involve just breaking a huge fucking chunk off the earth. That's what the moon was. Um, but I, yeah, I'm just, mm, guys, I'm so curious. Um, so yeah, this section was just really, really riveting. And, uh, I like how much I care about Nasoon because it can be really tricky with child characters and it can be really tricky when you've been with one character for a whole book to drop somebody else into the story in the second book and for me not to react in just frustration of like, ah, oh, come on, I didn't want to read about her. I wanted to read about him, you know, and I am finding myself just as enraptured with Nasoon's chapters as I was with Essence chapters. So... Yeah. And I, I also like uh, I'm I'm yeah, anyway. So I'm gonna jump ahead. I'm so far out of time. But chapter eight, I love this chapter. Asun is having a really hard time with figuring out where she fits into this commune, basically. And she hears people who are worried about having so many origins in one place. And that's part of the question that they're asked. Um, is like when people are being invited to come live here, can you live with origins? The ones who say yes, get to come in. The ones who say no, you understand without having to ask are not permitted to travel onward and potentially join other comms or comless bands to attack a community that knowingly harbors origins. There's a convenient gypsum quarry not far off, apparently, which is downwind. Helps to draw scavengers away from Kastrima over, too. So that's pretty dire. And then there's the natives. And these are the people who have been here since before the season. And they are all feeling away about tons of new people coming in here. However, there is something kind of like comforting to her about the fact that they're side-eyeing her, not necessarily because she's an origin, but because she's new and... And she hasn't proven that she's going to be any use to them yet. Um, it's surprising how refreshing this feels, being judged by what you do and not what you are. So she's getting involved with this like gardening thing and all of these different people are being put to uh, work on the various things that sort of speak 
most closely to whatever skills they had before they came here. And there's talk about all of these petty little things about, you know, somebody who's constantly complaining about the bath, somebody who keeps on like breaking the practice pottery that these people are, you know, it's sort of ruining their morale because this person doesn't understand that that only works when people are only doing this for fun and not when they're trying to do something to help survive. Um, just all of these little things and how Asun is starting to realize how happy she is to be living somewhere that these sort of petty concerns are starting to reach the top of the list of things that they think about during the day rather than it constantly being a battle for survival. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of good feeling in this section in its way, despite there's of course other shit going on, but, um, and there's a point where she like steps outside and sees the clouds and it looks to somebody who isn't an origin, like things might be improving, but she and this other guy know that's not the case and sort of look at each other and agree to not dis disabuse this uh, normie of his notion that maybe things are improving. And when she looks over, she notices that there's a weird sort of stone eater that's like yellow with like brownish uh, veining. And he's watching. But the next time she looks over, he's gone. And I don't like that. I want to know what the fuck is up with that. Um, and... As you're walking like through, because they're, I think they're just heading out for like a scavenging um, mission. She's walking through and she sees all of these mounds. And it turns out that these are the boil bugs that are building tons and tons of nests. Because that's how it is when things start to change like this. There is, um, there are things that die off Im immediately or eventually. And then there are things that just seem to thrive when everything else is going badly. And unfortunately, horrifying boil bugs are one of the things that's thriving. Ah, oh, that's literally the worst thing. It's just, uh, uh, you thought fire ants were bad. Jesus Christ. Um, so eventually, they come across this, um, this sort of ridge. And it says, uh, hazy in the golden light, you can see something standing above the flattened forest, a cluster of what must be stripped saplings or long branches set into the ground in an attempt at straightness. So they come up on this and it becomes clear that these are all impaled bodies. And they're trying to theorize who could have done this. Um, and like all of their patrols are accounted for. So this is not something like an attack on any of their own people. Um, and as far as like somebody who's like a traveler doing this, because that's what Esni theorizes, um, Cutter steps in and is like, dude, travelers travel. Doing something like this takes a lot of time. You'd have to like cut down trees and whittle them down and dig holes. Like, Nobody who's just traveling is going to do something like this. Um, so who do you think it is then? Another calmless band? They wouldn't either. At this point, they're not wasting bodies anymore. You wince and see several other people in the group sigh or shift, but it's true. There are still animals to hunt, but the ones that aren't hibernating are fierce enough or armored enough or toxic enough to be costly prey for anything but very well-prepared hunters. Um... If Kastrima doesn't find a new source of meat soon, you and the others won't be wasting bodies anymore either. That wince served many purposes. Um, so they come to the conclusion that somebody is marking territory. Uh, and one of the hunters is like, the only calm in that direction is Tetehi. And they're friendly. They have never given us any shit. Um, the river goes away to the north. That bothers you and you don't know why. There's no reason to mention this to the others, but still. When's the last time you heard from this Tedahi? We need to send someone. Someone who might end up on a pole? Nobody's expendable in this calm, newcomer, says Sharka. So this is the first time, as it says, that Asun has gotten Sharka's dander up. 
But she reasons, we have to send out a trading party anyway. We have to do this. And Jarka, she doesn't see it quite yet, is maneuvering her into a corner a little bit. And it's like, well, what if they're more powerful? And tr- gets a soon to say, send an origin with them. Who'll kill half our people trying to defend them? So what does a soon do? But does this beautiful demonstration of exactly how precise her power can be and how she would never, you know, if somebody has the skill, they're not going to let anything happen to anybody else when they attack an enemy. And um, like the whole thing, a moment later, everyone feels the faint judder of the ridge you're standing on because you've let a little of the aftershake come this way. Again, you didn't have to. You just had a point to make. It's commendable that Jarga just looks impressed and not alarmed when you open your, your eyes and turn to her. Nice, so you can ice someone without killing everyone around you. But if every Raga could do that, people wouldn't have a problem with Ragas. So she doesn't see it still. And she just winds up being like, oh, fuck. This is how Jarka gets her to agree to teach other origins. I keep wanting to say ragas, but because it's a slur on the books, I also don't want to be saying it. And I mean, as much as this is a necessary thing, and as much as I think it will do good in the end, it is really tough because of how much she was enjoying just an ordinary life of working with plants I can't imagine how hard it's going to be for her to go back into like training other people with her abilities and not having constant flashbacks to what was going on with her children, what was going on when she was at the fulcrum. Like this is going to be really, really hard. Um, So let's see. Sorry, Alexander. I love that one of the things Jemison included was how the wildlife of this world can completely change their behavior and diet based on environmental stressor. In the world, for instance, rabbit mothers will cannibalize newborns if there's overpopulation or resource scarcity. Yeah, uh, scarcity. Sorry. Um, but yeah, a lot of animals will, if not cannibalize, at least kill their babies because they can have more babies, you know. Um, but yeah, that is a it's a brutal detail. She, she clearly like got a lot of consultation from people who are experts in like climate change and, and um, you know, the different eons in history and what survived and what didn't because that there's just too much detail in this. Um, so she goes and talks to Alabaster who's just like, well, you're stupid for getting into this. Like, obviously that was where they were leading you to which she's like, I guess like somebody should teach them. And this leads to a fucking blowout that I loved which is basically as he alabaster is really, really bad at teaching, has no patience, just like makes people feel like idiots and, and essentially just fuck shit up. She decides that she's going to get up and walk away and not deal with his shit anymore. And he t- tries to stop her by doing something with his uh, origin that like makes things shake a little bit and makes everybody a little nervous. And she turns around and like unleashes on him and just is like, you are so fucking arrogant. You expect me to listen, but you don't share. You just demand and proclaim. Um, And all of this is like happening over him sort of shaking because he's like, you know, just done some origin and is like hurting himself. And she doesn't care. She just talks right over him because she's so angry that even the thing that would normally make her feel some sympathy just does not work. And finally it gets to a point where he's like, fine, fine. I will tell you what's been happening over the past, like, you know, several years, 10 years, I guess. And she sits down and it says, then he tells you everything. And that's the end of that chapter. So I was real mad that I had to stop there, but I did. And I have to now also. But I'm dying to know what the fuck was going on. So please tell me, book. Give me what I crave. All right. So I am, I know that there are two more booked already of uh, of this book. So I just want to let you guys know that you don't need to panic. This isn't in danger of going anywhere right now. Um, 
And I don't have the dates in front of me of when they are. But one of the uh, later ones, Denise has booked some extra time so that I have an extra half hour to talk about them, which I think is really a smart idea because this, these same, the same 50 pages in different books all contain different densities of information, different like, you know, is it high concept or not? Because if it is, then you've got a lot of extra stuff to talk about. So I really am 10 minutes over right now, you know, um, but I just had to talk about everything I had to. So Denise, good call on that. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, and if you guys are interested in booking some, you can go to unspoiledpodcast.com slash shop and uh, all that will be there for you. So thank you to Denise and to Alexander for coming and chatting with me. And I will be seeing you all soon, hopefully, with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.